Good afternoon and welcome to the second UNU Wider Research Webinar on how COVID is changing development. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU Wider and I'm very pleased to uh, chair this session this afternoon here in Helsinki. Um, I can see that there are a number of you online, and I think that some of you are new to UNU Wider. Uh, so just a little bit about, uh, about us. We are the United Nations University, uh, World Institute for Development Economics Research. And we've been here in Helsinki for over 40 year, 30 years now. Um, we are the first research center of the United Nations University, which mm. is the academic arm of the uh, UN system. <clears throat> and we work on issues of international development, uh, issues affecting the living conditions of the world's poorest people. I am very pleased today to welcome Dr. Yuan Yuan Ang. She is a political scientist, an expert on China and emerging economies. And she is currently Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan. Among a number of honors, she was awarded in 2018 an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. As an expert on China, she studies both China's political economy and its rising global role. She is the author of two books. Her first book is the award-winning book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. And her second book, which was published just this last month, I think, from Cambridge University Press, is entitled China's Gilded Age, The Paradox of Economic Boom and Vast Corruption. In addition to conducting field work in China, of course, she has also done field research in Cambodia, India, Malaysia, and Nigeria. So the topics that Dr. Ang studies, inclusive growth, poverty reduction, and state capability in particular, are close to our hearts here at WIDER and figure mm. quite prominently in our current work program, including some of my own projects. So in our current work on state capability, we focus broadly in, in two areas. The first is state effectiveness and institutional strengthening, including um, how more effective, capable, legitimate, authoritative states develop, um, and the second broad area of focus is how states and democratic governments function, including the pervasiveness and experience of clientelistic politics in the global south and the broader systemic consequences of, of clientelism for democracy and development. And as we think here about the impact of the current pandemic, um, we at UNU Wider have been thinking quite a lot about the relationship between COVID-19 and the state. And we were then delighted to see Dr. Ang's recent article um, in Nature Human Behavior entitled When COVID-19 Meets Centralized Personalized Power. And this is the topic of her presentation today. In a moment, I will turn uh, the microphone over to her. But first, just a brief note before we start on how the seminar will work today. So I think all of your microphones, um, as you should be able to tell, have been muted. Um, however, we will take questions at the end, um, and there will be a nice amount of time for discussion today. So please, I would encourage you to send some questions through the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if time permits, I will let a couple of you ask your questions directly. Um, otherwise, I will read some of these questions for Dr. Ang to, to address. So without further ado, let me turn over to our speaker, please. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and to UN Wider for having me in your timely series. In the last webinar by Andy Sumner, he talked about the effects of COVID-19 on poverty reduction from an economic perspective. And today, my role as a political scientist, I hope to share with you some light on the role of politics in shaping the Chinese government's response to the, to the pandemic. So the question of whether China has failed or succeeded in handling the COVID-19 pandemic is a hotly debated topic. And before I share my view, we'll love to hear yours. So please take a few seconds to participate in a poll that Ruby will be posting now and your response will be anonymous and collected shortly. Terrific. And then as we are working on this poll, let me move on to a second question. 
Hmm. Right, this is the first poll. Now, underlying the earlier question is a second question, which is a bigger and broader question that should interest anyone who studies the political economy of development. Are democracies, all autocracies, better at handling pandemics? And again, we'll love to hear your responses in a second poll. Do you think it's A, democracies, B, autocracies, or C, neither? So while we are waiting to collect your responses, and we'll talk about them shortly, let me review the state of polarized discourse. As I'm sure you know, views on China's response to the pandemic are deeply divided. On one end of the spectrum, you have the state media in China, which claims that China has done right, succeeded under strong leadership, and scored a total victory. Then on the other side of the, uh, of the spectrum, the US under the Trump administration is determined to blame China for the pandemic while not mentioning any of its own failures. This blaming is fast gaining currency and influence in American society. And some have even demanded that China compensate the world for its purported failures. So this is the deeply divided context in which we are having today's discussion. With that in mind, now let's look at the poll results, which I am very excited to see. Let me, okay. Um, let me read out the results for viewers uh, on video. The first poll is, has China failed or succeeded in handling the COVID-19 pandemic? 12% said failed, 31% said succeeded, and 57% said both. Uh, Rachel, does this surprise you? Is it, is it, was it what you had expect, you might have expected from this audience? Well, I, yeah, I suppose with a group of academics, we might expect um, a lot of academics to come out in the middle. <laughs> So that one wasn't surprising. I thought the second poll was, was maybe a bit more surprising. I, what let's, do you think? Let's, um, uh, since you mentioned the second poll, which uh, le let's look at the second poll. So the second poll is, are democracies or autocracies better at handling pandemics? Um, the, the votes are close. 28% say democracies, 24% say autocracies, and 48% neither. Hmm. Um, I think that um, I, w I think on the whole, it seems that about half of our audiences are in the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish that this is a representative sample of global public opinion. I wish it would be really interesting to compare the opinion of this group with the general uh, population. But I but I did find the close tie between democracy and autocracy. Very interesting, they have about the same number of votes. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, having seen your opinion on this question, now let me share my take on this question. So we are going to move on from the poll. My take on this question, which I think half of you already agreed already agree with me, so I'm preaching uh, to the converted, uh, it's both. Uh, although both is a very simple answer, it is often missing an existing discourses. And that's because we are in the midst of a US-China Cold War. The term Cold War is an imperfect analogy for the situation we are facing, because after all, China is not a close Soviet regime, Rather, it is tightly integrated into the global economy, but um, only using the term Cold War as a shorthand for rising US-China competition across all arenas except military conflict. The COVID-19 pandemic has become one of the arenas of competition. And it is against this backdrop that global public opinion is becoming deeply polarized and politicized. 
and we are all affected by this reality. In this environment, it is all the more important that we in the international development community maintain a commitment to balance and facts. The truth always has both sides. It's rarely only one or the other. And whether we are a speaker or a listener, I believe we each have a role to play in resisting polarization. So my presentation today will be based on this article in Nature titled, When COVID-19 Meets Centralized Personalized Power. It is available open access on the journal's website. The objective of this article is very simple. It is to tell both sides of the story, to explain in what way China failed, but also in what way it succeeded in responding to the outbreak and how this mixed response stems from its political system. The material that I draw upon are all facts that are already presented in the existing literature or in public domain. There is no exclusive scoop, but we do not need scoop. We, we just need someone to put two sides of the story together. So let me begin by previewing my argument. China's strong authoritarian regime has both strengths and weaknesses in dealing with an outbreak. And normally we hear only one or the other. So we need to keep both in mind. In terms of its strength, a strong authoritarian regime excels at mass mobilization and carrying out a determined national response once a decision is made at the top. Conversely, its weaknesses lie in the lack of transparency, a weak civil society to monitor problems. And on top of that, another problem I would highlight is that outcomes in the nation become entirely hinged upon the top leader's personality and decision. Under President Xi Jinping, who practices a centralized and personalized style of governance, compared to his predecessors, both of these strengths and weaknesses become amplified. And in the rest of my presentation, let me unpack this argument in four parts. Many people think of China as a monolith. They think of China, the whole political system as one opaque blog. They also think of its political system as static and unchanging over time because the PROC has always been a single party dictatorship. But this is incorrect. The first thing that you must know is that there isn't just one China, but at least three different Chinas since 1949. China under Mao, China under Deng, and China under Xi are three very different Chinas. Under Mao, China was a personalist dictatorship. Power was concentrated entirely in Mao's hands. Anyone who challenged his power was eventually tortured or killed. He built a personality cult, creating for himself a godlike status. Then enter Deng Xiaoping, who took over the reins of power after Mao died in 1976. Then launched a second revolution, China's market reform. He dissolved Mao's personality cult and established a party-based dictatorship, operating on the norms of collective leadership, decentralization, and pragmatism. These norms, which I call democratic characteristics, which is not the same as democracy as a regime type, forms the political foundation of China's economic rise. It was not autocracy that made China great again. Then you have Xi, who took over as the party's and nation's top leader in 2012. His administration marks a sharp break from Deng era's traditions, as is well documented by many China scholars Upon taking office, 
Xi sidelined other top leaders, crowned himself as the core leader, and shrined Xi Jinping thought into the constitution and abolished term limits. Within two years, his consolidation of power was so complete that Professor Graham Allison at Harvard described him as the chairman of everything. As the chairman of everything, Xi's regime tightened political control. In the decade before Xi, China actually saw an encouraging expansion of political freedoms, including mark-breaking journalism, transparency, and public deliberation initiatives. But starting in 2012, Xi clamped down on these liberalizing reforms. And this has impaired the ability of Chinese civil society to detect and sound the alarm on problems. In addition, China's vast bureaucratic apparatus also experienced tighter controls. In 2012, she launched the most aggressive crackdown on corruption in his party's history. Rather than rely on transparency and disclosure of assets, he employed the strong arm of the state apparatus, sending out an army of disciplinary inspectors to investigate and arrest those who are corrupt. This campaign has disciplined more than 1.5 million officials to date. Now, to his credit, President Xi took on a brewing crisis of corruption that other leaders have swept under the rug. This is a very difficult job that he's doing. The problem, however, is that his campaign has extended beyond police and graph to ensuring correct political thinking and conformity to seize orders. Under this climate, Chinese officials became afraid to take initiative or risk. This soon crystallized into an institutional problem of bureaucratic paralysis and inaction also known in Chinese as lazy governance. So in this comic, you see this official who has his head down on the desk, refusing to look up. And the words in the bubble says, I would rather do nothing or to do less. This problem of lazy governance grew serious enough that the state council warned against it by publicly shaming offenders for dereliction duty, delaying decisions, and leaving funds unused. So now with this backdrop in mind about the basics of Chinese politics, we can better appreciate the turn of events within the Chinese government leading up to a pandemic. Part three, the price of absolute power. Now to be sure, Governmental inaction, denial, and deception in the face of novel viruses is a persistent feature of Chinese governance. These problems earlier manifested during SARS outbreak in 2003. But I would like to point out that there are some striking differences in the political and bureaucratic dynamics between the two crises. During SARS, delays and inaction resulted from a fragmented bureaucracy and an oligarchic political structure, as public health expert Huang Yanzhong tells us. It took five months and multiple lines of reporting before the crisis seized the attention of the Politburo Standing Committee, which is China's highest ruling body. By contrast, during COVID, the timeline of communication appears more compressed and news went straight to the top. The first case of COVID was detected in Wuhan on December 21st. By January 7th, President Xi knew of the outbreak. We know this as a fact because he self-reported his actions in the party magazine Chiu Shi his actions from January 7th to January 22nd, the day before Wuhan's lockdown. Now, most of observers may think that it's, it's no big deal for a president to account for his actions. This is routinely done in democracies. But in China's context, this self-report by Xi is a rare disclosure to quote the South China Morning Post. Chinese leaders from Mao to Deng have never had to explain their actions in a detailed timeline. 
Such a rare disclosure is likely to have been made under heavy domestic and international pressure. This report indicates that on January 22nd, Xi gave the green light to the party. He told the Politburo, I explicitly ordered Hubei province to stop the flow of people outward. Adhering to the president's order, Wuhan announced a lockdown the next day on January 23rd. And that was when the world officially knew that China's outbreak was severe. The concentration of power under Xi meant that the paramount leader played the role of a giant on-off switch in the political system. Without authorization from the very top, local authorities did not dare to talk about or publicize the outbreak. We know this from an interesting incident involving Wuhan's mayor, Zhou Xianwang, who gave a live interview on CCTV in which he said, as the head of a local government, I can only release information after I'm authorized. And in fact, Joe implied that it was the hierarchs who did not authorize informing the public before the lockdown on January 23rd. That this interview was live streamed meant that his words could not be erased. While it is not uncommon for the Chinese central government to blame local authorities for delays and cover-ups, this is probably the first time that the local official passed the buck to the top on live television. Between January 7th and 23rd, some 5 million residents had already traveled from Wuhan to other parts of China and the world. By this time, the virus had gone global. But as soon as President Xi gave a clear edict to act on January 22nd, no effort was spared within China to contain the outbreak. The entire bureaucracy suddenly jolted into action, erecting new hospitals within days and keeping hundreds of millions of people penned indoors, making this the largest quarantine in human history. Fortunately, this determined response quickly brought down infection rates in China, which reported no new cases for the first time since the outbreak on March 19. China's success in crushing the curve stood in marked contrast to the United States, which has already passed the tragic threshold of 100,000 deaths, and it is still rising. And finally, we conclude. In conclusion, China has both failed and succeeded at handling the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not one or the other. It failed to stem the outbreak before it went global. Whistleblowers were silenced. Local officials did not dare to speak. There were no incentives to tell the truth. The whole nation awaited the top leader's edict. But once an edict was announced, China very effectively curbed infections within the country. Meanwhile, some governments are keen to blame China entirely for the pandemic. But for rational viewers out there, we all know that this is to deflect attention from their own failures. In the case of the US, the failures of the Trump administration are abundantly reported in the press and obvious to all but the most blinkered partisans. As the Washington Post writes, Trump can't blame China for his own failures. China did a lot of wrong, but it's not China's fault that Trump didn't listen to the warnings of the US intelligence community starting in early January. And then on this question about the effects of regime types on the efficacy in handling the pandemics, this is a false debate. It is a misguided debate. The market contrast in outcomes between China and the U.S. has led many to believe that democracies fail at controlling outbreaks, while autocracies under strong leadership succeed. This is oversimplistic and misleading. 
In fact, both democracies and autocracies have distinct strengths and weaknesses at handling pandemics. Yes, strong authoritarian regimes excel at mass mobilization, but to prevent epidemics from arising in the first place, the government requires democratic characteristics, a climate that empowers not only civil society, but also local officials to speak candidly about problems without fear of reprisals. A government, no matter how strong, cannot detect and preempt problems all the time. Conversely, having a democracy is by itself no guarantee of efficacy. It must also be combined with other qualities, sound leadership, respect for science, bureaucratic autonomy, state capacity, healthcare coverage, and social safety nets. Things that we have been advocating for the developing world for decades that are now lacking in parts of the first world. The tragic situation in the US today does not mean that all democracies are discredited. Rather, it means that the American democracy needs to be fixed. Finally, I'd like to end by reflecting on the theme of this series. How is COVID-19 changing development? First, the pandemic has intensified US-China rivalry, which means that everything will become politicized and everyone is expected to choose sides. This will impact international agencies profoundly, as we have seen in the case of the WHO. Second, in this context, we need balance and facts more than ever. And then third, I believe development professionals must be informed about Chinese domestic politics and US-China relations. In my work, I move between the international development and US-China audiences. And in my experiences, the two groups do not interact. They exist on different planes, they have different priorities, and they speak different languages. In international development, we operate on the assumption that development should be above politics. We should focus on economic and technical tasks. But as the end but as the pandemic has shown us, we cannot wish politics away. Even public health management, which is as technical as it can get, has become deeply politicized. We also learned from the pandemic that what happens in China doesn't stay in China. It has global consequences today. The development community knows a great deal about how democracies work. We all know how elections function. But by contrast, much, much less is known about how Chinese politics work at the most basic level. How are leaders selected? How are policies made and implemented? How do central local relations work? And how do domestic politics affect China's global policies and vice versa? The post-pandemic world will be a world divided between two superpowers, China and the US. This is something that we have never experienced before in the past century. Thus, for the development community to adapt to this new world, it must take Chinese domestic politics and US-China relations seriously and invest in learning about these issues. Well, I hope that today's presentation has begun this journey of learning about these issues. And it's a real privilege to share some of my thoughts with you. I look forward to your questions and comments during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Tuan. This is a really uh, terrific and, and thought-provoking presentation. And I know I'm sure that you've sparked a number of questions and thoughts from our audience. And just a reminder to them that they should be sure to enter their questions into the Q&A box here at the bottom of their Zoom screen. But before I turn to questions from the audience, I wanted to pose uh, one question of my own, or actually a two-part question okay. um, <laughs> to kick off the discussion. So I think that you make a really convincing argument that the right question to be asking is not whether autocracies or democracies are better at fighting epidemics. Um, and the big question isn't about regime type, but it's about other qualities of the state and governance. 
Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about the other qualities. Uh, so for instance, if we think that, you know, one way to think about the state or state society relations is in terms of three different dimensions of the state. So authority to control violence, capacity to provide services uh, such as sanitation, schooling, healthcare, um, and state legitimacy in terms of enforcing rules vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. society, right? So within this approach, you know, of course there are a number of different approaches, but just within this simple framework, the question then of whether autocracies or democracies are better at fighting epidemics, as I understand it relates to state legitimacy. Um, and if we think about legitimacy then as one dimension of the state uh, that might affect its ability to respond to the pandemic, I wonder how do we think about legitimacy in situations when leaders are not elected, so in autocracies? Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, how does this work in China in terms of the, the COVID policy response? Mm -hmm. And the second part of my question, what then about the relative importance of other dimensions? So state capacity, which you've touched on a bit in the presentation and, and state authority. I'm sorry, could you repeat the last question again? So then the second part of the question is about the relative importance of other dimensions. So for instance, state capacity, which oh, you touched okay. on a bit already, um, and state authority. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel, for kicking off with a big question. And one can write <laughs> several books to answer you. <laughs> These are truly big questions. And I know that you and Wyda and you yourself have been working uh, intensively on, on thinking about these questions. I'll share a few reactions just off the top of my head. Um, I think the first comment um, to make is that I think for a long time, we have conflated democracy with effective governance, right? That's sort of like implicit in the background. When we think about what is an effective government, we immediately think it has to be a democracy. And we sort of conflated these, these two things. And, and so I think it's important conceptually and also in terms of policy making to realize that the regime type, whether you are a democracy or not a democracy, and the effectiveness of the state are, are actually two separate things. You can have a democracy that is effective and not effective. Conversely, you can have an autocracy that is effective and not effective. So I think it's important to make that distinction. And then I think you raised a very important and big point about state capacity. Right. Um, and I think what we have seen in, um, in the experience of many countries, uh, including even in the United States, is that you do have a democracy, but it lacks the state capacity to prepare test kits, right, to, um, to uh, prepare a pandemic response team. Um, to execute the policies that were already made and so forth. So we can see obviously that state capacity and the capability of implementing policies is a very important dimension of efficacy. But I think I would like to take the opportunity to uh, highlight a different kind of capacity related to what I think is distinct from state capacity. And I would call that adaptive capacity. And that is an element of governance that has been very central in my work. And I've been thinking for many years about, hmm, um, what exactly is adaptive capacity and how is it different from state capacity? The way I think about it is that state capacity is focused on implementation with the assumption that good policies are already made, right? Well, well I think when we think about adaptive capacity, it is, as, it is, it is um, especially important in contexts like COVID-19, where the environment is uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of chaos. And so in, a, so in addition to implementing, you actually need a different set of qualities to help you cope with that uncertainty. And what are some of these qualities? I think I'll highlight a few examples. Um, I think the first is the ability to anticipate and recognize that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the U.S. is a good negative example in which we have we saw the outbreak on the other side for months and nothing was done. There was no anticipation or preparation. But if you look at the countries that did well, uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea, they were vigilant. And as soon as they saw that there was this outbreak in China, they were prepared well in advance. Right? So there's this, um, I think, anticipation, recognition of problems is very important. 
Um, you also see the effective states being able to promote um, bottom-up responses and collective learning. So I think the Taiwan example has been discussed quite a lot about how they were able to use technology to crowdsource um, inputs about where you can buy masks and so forth. Um, and so these are, I think, sporadic examples in which it's more about the capacity to anticipate and adapt over and above implementing policies. So I think these two should be considered together. And then you have a second question about legitimacy, and that is really um, a big question. <laughs> it has been really highly contested. Um, in democracies, legitimacy comes from elections, the fact that the leaders are chosen by the people and held accountable. And I think for a long time in China, the argument was made by the ruling party that our legitimacy well, well, they didn't directly make that argument, I, I have to clarify, but it's sort of implied that legitimacy comes from the ability, from economic growth, first of all, and the ability to deliver results. So schools, you know, healthcare, high, you know, increasing standards of living, which we do see in China in, in general, um, which then raises a very difficult question in current circumstances. After COVID-19, we know that China's economy will not be booming and is already not booming like it used to be, right? There's an economic slowdown. In fact, it is likely to see a recession like in the US. So economic growth can no longer provide that legitimacy. So it has to look for new sources of legitimacy. And I think this search for legitimacy is precisely what is driving this all out effort from China to say that we have succeeded in the, in the response, right? That they're trying to establish a new form of legitimacy in which uh, we had an exogenous shock, therefore we can no longer produce rapid growth, but hey, we fight the pandemic better than everyone else, right? Although the other side of the story is omitted in this account, which is what I've tried to uh, fill in, which is the fact that the political climate is not effective at preempting epidemics from arising in the first place. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I could keep asking questions, but I want to let our audience have a have a chance. I um, actually want to give um, our director a chance. He was one of the first in the list here with a question, uh, Kunal Sen. I'm going to try to unmute his microphone and hopefully he can answer, he can ask his question himself. So thanks, Rachel. I think I am unmuted now. Good, yes, we can hear you. So, you know, I had a question for you, which is to think about something that happened in China many, many years back, the Great Famine of 1959, 1961. Mm -hmm. At that time, Mao responded to the famine. And of course, this has been an area of research that we have seen wider taking part on uh, with mm. John Dress, right? So how would you see that episode of the way Mao addressed that particular famine, which is, as we know, many, many, many millions of people, versus what we saw, see now? What are the similarities and what, mm. are the and what can we learn from these two episodes? Mm. You want, um, would you like to answer now or would you like me to collect a couple of questions? We might be able to do that. <laughs> May, I think it would be easier for me to answer each one question at a time. Since Please. Everyone, no. Since everyone is asking book length questions. <laughs> 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 but it's very stimulating. Thank you, Kunal. Thank you, Kunal, about this question on the Great Leap Forward. Um, I'm really glad that you asked it because in my classes on both Chinese politics and governance, I always dedicate one session to talk about it because it has, it's a tragic event and has a lot of lessons. Uh, you asked about what are the similarities. Um, well, I think it's, it's, well, maybe we should first talk about the differences. I think the big difference that jumps out to me is that the Great Leap Forward is a tragedy that was self-made. It was, it was man-made. It was made by Mao's 
uh, flawed policies, his crazy vision that China is going to catch up with the West in 10 years, um, and, and all the things that follow from it, right? He, he um, punished anyone who dared to challenge his ideas, um, and he made the whole nation feel that they have to go along, right, with his vision, which eventually then led to this disaster. Whereas in COVID-19, this disaster is an exogenous shock, right? It rose from a virus that um, until this day, the cause is not known and it's not created by, by any one person. So I think in the beginning, uh, this is uh, this is a big difference between the two, but um, there are some similarities in the sense that um, you have you have um, you have problems that initially um, perhaps were not so severe that in the end became a massive tragedy, and if you look at the reasons for why that happened. Um, one of the reasons is that people are afraid to speak up, right? And so in the Great Leap Forward, um, some of Mao's uh, comrades had tried to openly uh, tell him that these policies are flawed, you know, we have to change course. And he reacted by silencing them um, in a violent way. And then afterward, nobody got to tell the truth anymore. Everybody knew that their incentives is to shut up and say, you know, whatever the leader wants to hear. And that set up the stage for the disasters that followed because there was, there was then falsification, uh, exaggerated targets and cover-ups. And if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the persistent problems that we continue to see is this climate where people are not afraid to speak the truth or that they don't see incentives to do so. So there's a quite good article that I would recommend. It's in the South China uh, Morning Post and it talks about China's uh, investment in a multi-million early warning system. China had actually invested a lot of money in creating such a system. So all of the institutions, the apparatus was in place but disappointingly, it did not work in stopping the COVID-19. And why is that? Because individuals feel that there are no incentives for me to report the truth about infectious disease, right? When I, when I try to do so, and we know that there are doctors who try to do so, uh, they were immediately uh, sanctioned for doing so. And so even though you have this hundred of, of you have this expensive state of the art, early warning system, if individuals are not incentivized to use it and to speak the truth, then it is not going to work. And then you're going to have a situation where the problem is out of control. And now the leader knows about it. And now he's going to take action. But in the case of viruses, it's too late because the nature of viruses is that once you pass um, a critical you know, window in the first few days of that outbreak, that virus has already spread throughout the country or even throughout the world. So that is the, 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 one of the key similarities I see. So the lesson here, if, if I had to take one away, is that we need to create an environment where people in society or in the government feel comfortable and are empowered to speak the truth. That is actually really necessary for good governance and especially for combating outbreaks. Thank you, Helen, that's very good. Thank you. Um, so we've got a number of open questions here, but I think one that follows quite nicely on Kunal's question is uh, posed by Tony Addison. Um, he asks, uh, many epidemiologists take the view that the pandemic has more waves to come, maybe small, maybe big. Uh, if the second wave in China is a big one, what do you think the implications, the political implications will be? Mm, that's a very, it's also a very big question that I have to think <laughs> about it. Yeah. I, I, it's, I hesitate because, you know, it's, it's almost too scary to imagine more waves to come. Um, I'm, and I'm not an 
epidemiologies, obviously, so I, I do not know what is the likelihood of that. But I think all things equal at this point, China has shown that it has effectively controlled effect infections compared to countries like the US. So I think even if more waves were to come, China is taking it very seriously and will likely keep it under control. So we do see reports coming out every day, you know, if whenever there is a new case, uh, this is immediately reported and strong actions are, are taken to a uh, lockdown and so forth. Um, so that's not so much what I'm worried about. I think what I'm more worried about is that China is facing other challenges. Number one, the economic recession. Um, it is likely to see a massive wave of unemployment, although we do not know the true extent of this problem. We do know that it is a serious problem because in the, in the uh, two sessions meeting that was just held last week, uh, GDP targets were abandoned. And the one thing that was put on the table is unemployment. Right? So I think that is a much more concerning issue to me. The other very concerning issue is China's relations with the US. If, if China wants to uh, rebuild its economy, it needs to have good relations with the US. Right? It needs to reopen up trade. It needs to have friendly relations with all other countries in the global capitalist world. Um, this is the second biggest challenge facing China. So it's, I think, in a sense, squeezed by both domestic economic challenges as well as by foreign policy challenges. And these, we must keep in mind, is not just a China problem. It is a problem for the whole world because the China and the U.S. combined already accounts for more than half of the world's GDP. Mm. Um, just uh, maybe switching gears a little bit, we have um, uh, one question here that uh, might be interesting to turn to, relates to some of your final points in your, in your presentation, the last slide. This is from uh, Jingfei Ma. She says, uh, thanks, Professor Ang, for the thought-provoking presentation. I agree with you with your idea that development scholars and professionals need to take U.S.-China relations seriously in the current context. What would be your suggestions to bring the two fields together to speak to each other, ah. especially for international organizations that are <laughs> mandated development tasks? Um, it seems difficult for them to be free from and to deal with domestic politics and the influence of geopolitics. What are your suggestions to them? Thank you, Jingfei, for this question. You know, in fact, as I was typing this final point, my PowerPoint, I was like, what can be done about this? <laughs> and I think that I hope that as a first step, just by raising this point, we can begin to have a conversation that um, the global geopolitical environment has been disrupted. And I think we need to recognize that international development as a field, as a practice arose in a particular historical context, right? After World War II, where the basically the Western free world has won. And, and, it, and that environment, that liberal global order, as, as it is called, provided 70 years of long peace and, and stability, founded on values of liberalism. Right? And so international development operates on that assumption. And therefore, we, we do not need to talk about politics because implicitly, we already accepted all of those norms. And we focus on economics, economic development and public services delivery and so forth. Um, and I think as a first step, the whole community has to come together and recognize that that global context that undergirded our field is already gone. It's already been blown up. Uh, and we see that happen with WHO, right? I, I myself would have thought that public health is a really technical subject. You have to be an epidemiologist to talk about viruses. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, hazard to uh, speculate on these issues. But even the WHO was caught up with all of these politics, and we saw the leader of the WHO plead to the world, you know, please do not politicize the pandemic. But as I said, you cannot wish the politics away. 
So I think, first of all, it would be really great to have uh, perhaps an internal dialogue uh, within the international development community to talk about this disrupted geopolitical environment and what does it mean for the work of international development going forward? You know, how do we deal with the big issues, which is the Cold War, the, the possible expectation that you have to choose size, the polarization, the politicization, how would that affect the policy making and the public communication of international development? Right? The way you speak, the way you deliver, or even your, in your best efforts to deliver balanced accounts, that's very difficult in practice. Um, so I think all of these, we need to talk about it internally first. And then the second step uh, I would suggest is then for this international development community to have a conversation with the US-China community. And in my experience, as I said, these are very different audiences because the US-China community takes as its starting point that national borders are the most important thing. It's all about national politics and who's winning. In international development, we have a global mindset, right? We work for the global good. So we're not thinking about who's going to win, you know, in the pandemic. But, but these communities are asking such different questions and have such different assumptions. And I think we, we do need to sit down and then have a talk about um, how, how can we have a common conversation? And how can we continue to do our work in international development and serve the global public in a way that doesn't get disrupted or politicized by you know, the geopolitical uh, audiences. Um, I think these are the two essential steps. And then the third I would suggest is, it is always very difficult to talk about politics in the development community, but I think it should be built into the curriculum and the training of development professionals at mm -hmm. least some element of it. I think it's, it's, it would be really inadequate to work in international development today without having you know, a, 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 at least an average grasp of how Chinese politics work, it being now the second largest economy in the world. Um, so I think there's also a need to change the way we train professionals uh, in international development, which for many, many years was grounded in a Western liberal context. Yeah, I'd love you. to hear suggestions from others too. So these are <laughs> just my modest uh, suggestions, but I'm sure that audiences on the other side of the screen would have far better ideas than me. I'm actually really interested to hear from you on how to take this forward. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's a strange format for discussion <laughs> as compared to a normal seminar yeah. with, with everybody in the same room. Um, but following up on that, I wanted to ask a bit more about aid and China's role, um, say China in Africa and, and so on. There's a question here that asks more specifically, this is Rana Ijaz Ali Khan. He, um, the question is, when we talk about polarization, which may affect international development, then what will be the scope uh, for countries like Pakistan connected with Belt and Road. But more broadly, what, what do you think about the implications um, for China's, China's role and China's um, experience in Africa in particular and, and in, in other global south, in other parts of the global south? So I have uh, had the privilege to work with different parts of the UN on not, not on um, um, international growth issues, but specifically on China's development model and BRI. Mm -hmm. um, and so from that experience, I have, um, I have learned a lot um, about sort of the, the underlying challenges of dealing with a, with a polarized geopolitical environment. And, and, and country officers, in fact, have a lot of um, implicit political knowledge. But, but all of this is not recorded. <laughs> you just kind of learn it, right? You, you learn it by practice and it's sort of not recorded. And, and I think in my own experience of, of um, advising and working on these issues, one, I have a few takeaways to share. 
Um, I think the first thing we need to bear in mind when we look at China's global role, including its foreign aid and Belt and Road, is that China is not a monolith. And, and you need to start by figuring out who are the actors, who's doing what. And once you are able to have a grasp of who's doing what, you'd be very surprised that it is not as coordinated or coherent as you think it is. Chinese politics has always been described as fragmented authoritarianism. Uh, there are a lot of paradoxes because yes, on the one hand, I've just told you that the supreme leader you know, centralizes power, but at the implementation level, it is at the same time so fragmented. So Belt and Road is Xi Jinping's uh, signature foreign policy. So, and you can see again, the power of his vision as the Supreme Leader. But when you look at the actual implementation, you'd be stunned at just how fragmented that process is. So I think when we look at China's global role, first we need to understand the nature of the actors involved. Then the second thing I would point out is change over time. Uh, it's unclear at this point how China's global policies will change in the post-pandemic world. Even before COVID-19, I think it was already facing many challenges and headwinds. It was getting a lot of pushback from the United States and, and other Western countries that were worried about its apparent ambitions. And after COVID-19, I think it remains to be seen. Uh, how those global policies uh, will change. Um, but those are the two things that I would sort of keep in mind when we look at, when we look at um, China's global role. A third thing I would point out, just a final comment, is that one of the challenges of operating in a polarized world is, at least on my part, I've always tried to stand in the middle and give a balanced account. I find that when you stand in the middle and give a balance account, in a sense, that is the worst position to take because people on both sides of the extreme will be mad at you. <laughs> you know, if you say China uh, failed, the pro-Chinas will be, how dare you say China failed, right? And if you say China succeeded, the anti-Chinas will be, how dare you say China succeeded? Uh, so I, I think we need to be prepared as a community that we must commit to a balanced position but when you do so, the consequence of that is that you get criticisms from both sides. And, and, we need to, and we need to build a community of norms where being balanced is a good thing. We need, to, we need to put that value on the table. I would call that intellectual herd immunity. <laughs> yeah, we need herd immunity against COVID-19. We also need intellectual herd immunity in the face of polarization and politicization. We need to build values that, yes, we value balance, yes, we value, we value facts, and we will provide a safe space for people to give balanced accounts and tell both sides of the story, without which individuals are afraid to speak up. Thank you. I think this is, um, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, but I think this is a really nice place to close the conversation. And you've given us a lot of food for thought in terms of thinking about COVID response, the state, um, helping us to have a more balanced and fact-based view of the role of China and the future of the, the international development landscape. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. We would normally give you a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It's been very stimulating for myself and uh, I, I am eager to learn from colleagues on the other side of the screen. Thank you very much to you and Lida for having me in this stimulating conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.